Satya, you can take it away. Satya. Thanks, you Satya. Are, yeah. um, thanks, everybody. This is Satya Rhodes Conway. I'm the managing director of the Mayor's Innovation Project. Um, I want to thank you all for joining us today. Um, as most of you know, the Mayor's Innovation Project is a national learning network for mayors and their senior staff. And we've been around since 2005, and we've focused on the high road of equity, sustainability, and democracy. For the past uh, couple of years, we've been really pleased to partner with the Behavioral Insights Group at Harvard um, on a cohort of cities using behavioral insights. And um, I just think it's a really exciting uh, project. It's a really exciting opportunity um, to have been able to work with the, the smart folks at Harvard and some really great folks around the country. Um, who are wanting to learn and apply behavioral insights. Um, so it, I won't say any more, but I just want to say thanks to our, our partners at Harvard and thanks to all of you for being interested in this cohort um, and hope to be reading your applications soon. Thank you, Satya. Um, welcome, everyone. I'm Katya Sabados. I'm a senior associate with the Mayor's Innovation Project and the project coordinator for this behavioral insights cohort. We're really excited to welcome you and have you on the line today and really excited to kick off year two of our behavioral insights city cohort. So this call is meant to give you more information on the cohort itself, which is an opportunity for Mayor's Innovation Project member cities to partner with MIP staff and behavioral insights group researchers to work on a project together for approximately one year. This webinar will go into more detail on what behavioral science is, ways that it's been applied to cities, and then all of this in order to help you identify project ideas and apply for the cohort. So really quick here, just a little information about the cohort to kick us off. Um, cities can apply beginning today, so you'll receive an email after this webinar, about an hour after the webinar, with slides from today's presentation, a recording, and a link to the application itself. Uh, we'll accept applications through March 16th, and this application is really designed to get good information about your project ideas and to make sure we have enough information so that our Harvard partners can match your ideas to researchers who want to work on those things with you. We've incorporated information about what we've learned during the first year's cohort to inform and improve our application, and it's longer this year as a result. So please don't hesitate to reach out to us with questions about the application. We'd also be happy to work with you to complete it or to review it in a, a draft in advance of submitting it if it's helpful. And while applications will be accepted through March 16th, we really encourage you to submit as soon as possible. Submitting early will give us a chance to review your application, follow up with you if we have questions, and give more time for BIGS researchers to try to match uh, your project ideas to their areas of interest and expertise. We'll notify you by April 9th of the outcome of your application, and then um, that we'll use that time to review applications and match projects to Harvard researchers. Cohort members will be asked to send their mayor and a staff person to an in-person workshop at Harvard on May 3rd and 4th, uh, for which we'll provide travel and hotel support. And then the cohort will last approximately one year and involve staff in your city having regular check-in calls and meetings with the researcher you're matched to and testing at least one behavioral science intervention over the course of that year. So, we're truly excited to have a great array of Harvard faculty and researchers on the call with us today. And very thankful for that. We'll let them introduce themselves in more detail, but they'll include Mike Norton, who will introduce the Behavioral Insights Group and give an overview of the topic in general, Elizabeth Keenan, Ashley Willens, and Christine Exley, who will provide examples of work they've done with cities, and Dr. Oliver Hauser and Holly Dijkstra, who will talk about what makes a good field project and offer some more information on how to complete a good application for this cohort. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Michael Norton. Welcome, Michael, and I will make you the presenter just now. So you should get a little pop-up on your screen to share your slides. Great. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for taking time um, to join us today. I'm trying to show my screen. Maybe you can see my daughter. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> a little Good. positive mood prime. <laughs> Can't get the other screen back. Maybe I'll just riff on how much I like my daughter. Or two. Hmm. 
Let's see. Do you know how to bring up that screen that was on before? I'm not sure. Um, you should just be able to go to your PowerPoint, um, to your slides themselves, and it will just share. Yeah, I'm hoping. Oh, I thought we were doing one presentation. I'm sorry, that's my bad. Oh, no worries. Yep. Okay. So, are you so right now I see presentation mode, so I can see the slide and then the next slide in notes. Um, I don't know how to move that over, so maybe we'll just go with that. Um, so um, I can't figure out how to switch my screens, which shows you how good I am at science, but um, I just wanted to quickly say um, an intro to the Behavioral Insights Group, which is um, a, a few years old. Um, it was established at Harvard to try to bring together behavioral researchers across the school who were interested in human behavior, but I think more importantly, interested in public policy. So trying to help citizens do the things they say they would like to do, like be healthier and uh, vote more and be more civically engaged and things like that. And the goal from the very beginning was to work with uh, governments, like from all the way from local governments to uh, national governments, to try to use behavioral insights to um, help citizens um, in their everyday lives. So um, every other faculty member on the call will talk about research that they've done with the goal of um, improving um, citizens' engagement or in citizens' well-being uh, and things like that. I'm just going to quickly give you an overview of what behavioral insights is because it's a term that could mean any one of a million things. So just to give you a sense of our brief approach, you'll, re you'll really see it in action in the presentations by the other people on the webinar. But just as a quick approach to how we think about what it means uh, to try to use behavioral science instead of the other methods that people use, what is the unique contribution of these methods? So um, here's a, a quick um, little test for you. So um, look at all of these words and write down um, as many as you, I'm sorry, first just look at these words for 30 seconds and rem try to remember them. Don't write anything down yet, just commit them to memory. You can use whatever strategy you want to use them, uh, to remember them. I'll give you like 10 more seconds. I'm gonna quiz you on these in a second, by the way, so really try to remember all of them. Okay, now pick up a pencil and, or pen and write down all the words that you can remember from that list. And really try, I'll give you a few seconds to think about it. Um, and I'm going to um, grade you and whoever gets the fewest has to leave the call. No, I'm only kidding. But really do try to think about all the words that you can remember from the list. Oh, I might have fixed it. Okay, so now um, I'm going to quiz you like this. So um, do you remember, so did you write down snore? Look at your list and see if you wrote it down. Now look and see if you wrote down wake. These are all real words that were on the test. See if you wrote down wake. Give yourself a little point. See if you wrote down blanket and give yourself a little point. See if you wrote down nap and give yourself a point. And then finally, see if you wrote down sleep uh, and give yourself um, actually a minus one point because um, I bet from past experience, many of you wrote down sleep as a word that you remembered, but in fact, it's not in the list. Uh, and you can see what happens, right? So there's all of these terms that are related to sleep in the list. And then somehow your mind thinks of sleep because it's primed by all of these other words. You didn't mean to think of sleep. Sleep is incorrect, actually. So if I were doing real points, you would have gotten points off for writing down sleep. In most studies, something like 40 to 50% of people remember sleep as being on the list, even though it wasn't. And I open with this in part just because it's a good example of how we think about behavioral science, which is um, you can see why people are doing it. Like you can see why sleep came to mind, even though it's not in the list. 
because that's how the mind is actually structured to associate things that are similar. And most of the time, it's perfectly fine. There's no cost to thinking that you saw sleep. But sometimes in the world, when our mind works in the way that it's designed to work, it can lead us astray. And when it leads us astray, we can do all sorts of things that we later regret. And that's true in our everyday lives, and it's also true in, in policy domains as well. So it's really, it's not this idea that people um, are irrational and don't understand what they're doing. It's that the mind is built in a certain way to do things, and sometimes it does perfectly great, and sometimes the way it's built can lead us um, down the wrong path. So uh, just one more example of how weird um, humans are. There's a survey from a few years ago where they asked people, do you think this person's going to get into heaven? So you can see when it was. It was actually, in, I think, in the late 90s. So Bill Clinton, 52% of people thought he was going to get into heaven. Michael Jordan, 62%. Mother Teresa, 79%. And then the highest um, person of all, which was 87%, people thought um, was themselves. So <laughs> everyone believes that they will get into uh, heaven, even though these other people are, are less likely to. And again, if you think about that, if I asked you, are you going to get into heaven? You'd say, yeah, th of course I am. Again, we have these views of ourselves that are um, biased in a sense. They might be more positive than they actually are. They might just be inaccurate from who we really are. But again, they're not, they're surprising in the sense that this is sort of funny that we think we're better than Mother Teresa, but they're also predictable. So we know now that people think very highly of themselves and that might lead them down the wrong path and we can design interventions that will help them get back um, on the right path. So if we think about kind of the, the approach, so one approach, there's many approaches to understanding humans. One of them is kind of the traditional economic model, which is that people are pretty rational and they sort of make decisions based on full information. And if we incentivize them, like with money, then they'll make decisions that maximize their outcomes. And so if we want to change people's behavior, we use financial incentives and we use new information. So like changes in tax policy, what we're trying to do is incentivize people to change their behavior. Or public uh, service campaigns, we're trying to give more information so that people will learn and change their behavior. And those things can work sometimes, but as we all know, Sometimes we do things that are not in line with our financial incentives, and sometimes um, information doesn't seem to change our behavior. Like now I know that I definitely should exercise and not eat pizza. I'm very aware of the information, and if you gave me a test, I would get 100%, and yet I don't exercise and I eat pizza. So it's not an uh, uh, information problem. There's something else going on that we need to understand. Um, so behavioral economics or, or um, behavioral science more broadly is this idea, it's not that, that the traditional models are wrong or worthless, it's just a complementary approach, is the idea that um, humans are human. So we have limitations and biases. Our mind makes us think of sleep uh, instead when it's not on a list. Uh, we're not able to regulate ourselves, so I know I shouldn't eat pizza, but I'm eating it anyway. Uh, and we are social beings, so we're influenced by all sorts of um, things about other people uh, as well. And so the idea is that to influence behavior, we have to get at the t psychological roots of behavior, and sometimes that means that giving people information or changing their financial incentives just doesn't do anything, and we need to think of different things that motivate people based on who they really are and how they really think. So this is a little joke that like instead of the brain um, working like that, it's kind of like this, where we have a little tiny brain that's working kind of well, but it leaves a lot to be um, desired. So I want to give a couple of quick examples before I turn it over and you can hear about research. But this is one of my favorite studies, um, not a study of mine, but one of my favorite studies uh, that um, behavioral economists have done. And you'll know the outcome as you're just looking at it. So um, in one study, they asked people, um, imagine you're ordering lunch for next week. And they said, would you take fruit um, for dessert or would you take chocolate for next week now? Right. So a week from today, what would you like for lunch? And of course, a week from now, everybody says fruit. Of course, I would love fruit a week from now. But then with another group of people, they say on that next Monday, they say, um, here's fruit and here's chocolate. What do you want right now? And then, of course, everybody <laughs> chooses chocolate. So we are aware that we should eat fruit. It's not like we don't understand it's better. But in the moment when we're faced with fruit and chocolate, we really want to eat the chocolate instead. That's kind of a fundamental insight into what happens with behavioral economics, which is that um, we know that we should eat fruit. We know incentive-wise, we know that it's better for us to eat fruit. But in the moment, we're human, and we might um, fail to self-regulate and make some um, pretty predictable mistakes. So I just put up a few. Some of these have sort of crossed into the popular zeitgeist. Um, this isn't an exhaustive list, but, but the idea is that we can see all sorts of ways that people don't behave perfectly rationally or perfectly in line with their interests. So the eating chocolate today, you can think of it as present bias. 
which is we underweight the future, like thin me in a week, because we want to have um, delicious chocolate um, today. Um, self status quo bias, for example, once we've done something, we have a hard time breaking out of it, even though it might not be optimal. And we already talked about self control, which is um, uh, when yes, in prospect, you think that fruit is good, but in the moment you can see the chocolate and it smells really good and we just lose our ability um, to control ourselves. And so the whole point of behavioral economics is not just to understand those um, limitations or weaknesses, but then to design interventions based on the underlying psychology that can help people overcome them. And, and typically what we're asking is people say, can you please help me not eat chocolate? And we say, yes, let's see if we can design an intervention. We're often not trying to say, we think everybody should do this. Let's make them do it. Instead, we're saying, what are things that people themselves are struggling with? And can we help them by designing interventions that will help them? So one great example of a self-control uh, mechanism is lock boxes. So imagine that you don't want to eat chocolate today. So what you do is you put it in a lock box where the um, combination won't let you open it for a week. Now that's pretty extreme and it doesn't make a lot of sense until you understand that unless you do that, you're definitely going to eat the chocolate. Um, another one that I like a lot is for, for present bias, which is today matters and later doesn't. Well, then I can commit to things again today that I can't change later on. Like I can commit to saving uh, more for retirement and then I make it harder to change later on and therefore I do a better job. I, I won't go through all of these exhaustively because the um, researchers that you'll hear from now are gonna talk about different ways of thinking about what is a problem that people have and what are the interventions that we can um, design. And we pick these um, three researchers in particular because they're doing in different domains they all um, have projects that are not only related to this idea of behavioral economics, but problems that relate specifically to issues that policymakers have. And again, um, as we said, our goal is to find collaborations where we can help each other. We can test our um, research ideas in collaboration with um, uh, uh, people uh, who are interested in collaborating um, as well. So with that, um, I just want to give one example that I love, and then I'll uh, turn it over. You may have seen this, and it might be even on your electricity bill now. This is um, from Opower, which is an uh, uh, energy company, and all they did was um, showed you um, your efficient neighbors, your, all of your neighbors, and then your usage. And they find that people change their energy consumption just on the basis of this. This is an example of social norms. Now, this does, now people know that they shouldn't use a lot of energy. They know that they have to pay for it, so all of that is already in place. Just showing them how they compare to other people changes their behavior. I wanted to show this too because often the interventions that we design, they're designed to be low cost. This is, they were already sending out bills to everybody. All we're doing is printing something different on the bill and we're changing consumers' behavior in ways that are better for the environment and better for them. So think of examples like this as the other researchers talk now where you can really see sometimes you have to change tons of things. Sometimes little changes in, in the way um, citizens see things can really change um, their behavior for the better. Um, so just quickly, the idea of what we do is experiments, and um, Oliver and Holly will talk more about this at the end, but what people usually mean by experiments is um, we've been doing something some way, and then we do something different, and we see how many people behave differently, like how many people turn green after we institute this policy. And the problem with that is we're not quite sure what else happened along the way. So if we institute a new tax policy in between, and also the economy crashes, well, we don't really know if people change their behavior because of the tax policy or because the economy crashed. And so really, really simply, all we do are experiments where we just split everyone randomly into two groups. Some of them get the new tax policy or whatever it might be, and others don't. And then if the economy crashes in the middle, yeah, there's probably gonna be an effect of the economy crashing, but over and above that, we can start to see whether our intervention had an effect. That's why we care so much about experiments, not because we just think they're, they're cute or anything, but because we really think you can learn much, much more about what's really happening and how effective your policies are when you do very simple experiments, as opposed to kind of just experiment with things and then, and then see what happens. And again, you'll see with all of the researchers how they implement experiments, and Oliver and Holly at the end will talk more about what it means to implement um, one of these. So that's all for me, so I can give it um, over to the next presenter. Um, but again, we look forward to, to hopefully meeting many of you uh, in uh, Boston soon. Great, thanks, Mike. I am going to turn it over to you, Liz.
Perfect. Okay. Everybody can see my screen, hopefully, and hear me. All right. Um, so my name is Elizabeth Keenan. I am an assistant professor in the marketing unit here at Harvard Business School. And what I'm going to share with you today are a few projects in brief um, that I've had the opportunity to work on with other organizations out in the field um, and similar to what Mike explained, to run experiments um, where we have one group that we don't do anything to and we have another group that we um, implement some intervention and then we see whether or not it helped. So a lot of the work that I do um, is uh, involves charity uh, and working with charity groups and trying to do things that would help to motivate donors to be more likely to give or to even give more um, through their through their donations. So the first two projects are focused on charity. The last is um, regarding uh, work I did with a hotel a long while back, um, but also a really fun example of just a small change um, really having a, an interesting effect. So, all right, so the first project here um, is what we call pseudo set framing. This idea actually came from one of the PhD students here at Harvard Business School who's since graduated and is now a professor at a university in Spain. Um, but what she identified is this funny um, behavior that individuals seem to exhibit, which is to be motivated to complete sets of things. So a pseudo set is a, you know, when we actually sort of arbitrarily group various items or tasks together um, and frame it as a cohesive set. And when things are framed as a cohesive set, this seems to encourage people to expend either more resources, um, such as energy or time, um, trying to complete that set. For example, if you look to the right side of the slide there, um, you could have one instance where you're um, trying to encourage people to write cards for um, individuals at a nursing home, for instance. So in one group, you could say, you know, please write some cards. And as soon as they complete one card, you just say, you've completed one card, would you like to do another? And then see if they do more. Versus framing it as a batch or a set Instead of telling them you've just completed one card, would you like to do another? You could instead say you've completed 25% of one batch and we just arbitrarily batched it into a group of four here. Would you like to complete another? And what, what was found was that when it's set, when it's uh, you know framed as this batch, people were more likely to complete a set and get to four than they were when it was just described as you know one off. Uh, completion, so you've completed one card. Um, based on those findings, we ended up working with the Canadian Red Cross um, during their holiday gift campaign, um, where they present donors with various items that they could donate um, through throughout the holidays. And what we were wondering is, could we actually get them to actually select more of those items to complete a set or a kit um, if we framed it such as a pseudo set. So in this instance, this is one example. This is sort of a control example. Um, so in some instances, potential donors saw this image and they were invited to deliver gifts um, to help others during the holiday season. And they could select whatever gifts they wanted. And when they did select a gift, if you look to the right side of that um, image, you can see a little bubble pop up. It shows where that gift's gonna be helpful. Um, so every time they would select a gift, that, that would be what they saw. Well, if we reframe it and create a set or a kit or pseudo set out of this, um, on the next slide here, what you can see is every time they select an item, it starts to fill in this circle. And so that red line grows. And every time they select a new item, that red circle starts to fill in all the way until they um, have a full set and they're told the percentage filled so far. And what we found was just making that one small change um, definitely made individuals more likely to complete a full set. So those that saw the control um, image, 4.6% of them were likely to select all six items compared to 20, over 20% 20 of individuals that saw it framed as a pseudo set. Those individuals, um, there was 20% of individuals that were, uh, that would choose all six items. Uh, so it seemed that framing this um, arbitrarily as a set actually encouraged individuals to sort of fill up this kit um, into a complete set. 
So that was that was one example. And again, after this presentation, I'm sure um, the opportunity will be presented for you guys to be able to ask additional questions about these things later by email, potentially happy to answer those. Um, in the next project, um, we worked with a large charity organization um, around this idea of individuals aversion to overhead. So when you give a large when you give a donation, a proportion of what you give is actually used on administrative and fundraising costs. And it turns out people don't feel really good about that. We'd much prefer our money to be used entirely on the programmatic expenses rather than on these administrative costs. And after playing around um, with uh, some sort of pretests uh, ahead of time, we realized that individuals understand the importance of overhead um, and they understand that it exists and that it needs to be covered in some way, but they'd much prefer that their own money isn't used that way. So if somebody else wants to cover the overhead for them, fine, but they just don't want to cover it themselves. And so based on this information, we ran an experiment with a, with a large charity. Uh, there was a donation request being sent out to about 40,000 individuals. And we split this population up into four different groups. And we also used some money that was available from a large um, generous donor who was going to be giving money to this campaign anyway. And we reframed how we described this money being used. So in one condition, individuals just received a standard solicitation and they weren't told anything about this additional gift given to the charity. In another group, the individuals were given the same standard solicitation plus a little more information. They were told, we've already received $10,000 toward this campaign. In another group, they saw the same standard solicitation, um, but rather than being told that we've just received 10,000, it was framed as being part of a matching campaign that they've received $10,000 to actually match um, future donations. And then in a fourth group, which was our overhead free group, um, individuals were told about the campaign and also told about this $10,000 received, but they were told it was being used to cover overhead. And if you really think about it, the only difference between the seed, what we call the seed condition and the overhead condition was how that $10,000 was being used. Um, but essentially it was the same thing. We've received $10,000 and in the overhead free, we've said, and we're using it to cover overhead. They were then asked if they would be willing to donate and how much. And then we took a look at how much individuals actually gave. And what you can see on um, the up and down axis there, we have the total amount raised in these conditions. And along the bottom, I've labeled our different groups of people. And you can see we raised $8,000 in the control group. That's, that's what we raised there. Um, when they were told there was $10,000 already received for the campaign, individuals were motivated to give, um, to be more likely to give, and they gave up, up to $13,000. Um, when it was used as a match, they gave around $12,000. But notably, when that $10,000 was described as covering overhead, they raised $23,000 in that condition. And it wasn't that individuals gave more on average. It just turned out that there were more people willing to give in that condition compared to the others. There was something about the fact that overhead was being covered, motivating them to give. Uh, so that was also an interesting um, event. And in the sake of time, I'll go on to the third one. Um, so this last project was um, an opportunity to work with a uh, hotel and their challenge was um, they wanted to increase towel reuse. So when you go to a hotel, you have the option of allowing housekeeping to switch out your towels for fresh ones every day or in many hotels now you'll see placards in the bathrooms asking you to hang up your towel to be reused the next day rather than replaced. And this would, of course, save time and energy and money um, on behalf of the hotel, and it's a good environmental thing to do as well. So the intervention we decided to employ was a very simple one. Um, it was to invite guests to commit to being environmentally friendly during their stay. And as Mike talked about at the end of his presentation, um, this present bias um, sort of uh, habit we have and one way of coming getting around it would be to commit to particular behaviors ahead of time. We knew that there was some power in this idea of commitment. So if we could just get people to commit at check-in to reusing their hotel towels during their stay, maybe they would be more likely to do so. Now they're never gonna know if we know. All they need to do is say yes or no at check-in and then they could leave, go into their room, and ask hotel, you know, ask ask housekeeping to replace their towels, and we would never know. Though we did, we actually went into their rooms um, before housekeeping had a chance to check and see were towels hung for reuse if they've made the commitment. So what did this look like? They showed up at the check-in desk, they checked in for their their stay, 
um, in our sort of holdout or control group where we didn't do an intervention, we just told them about the hotel's commitment to being environmentally friendly. And that's the card on the left. The card on the right was given um, in some cases to a different group of people. Um, they also read about the hotel's commitment to being environmentally friendly, but there's this additional request at the bottom. It says, you know, I care about the environment when I travel um, and I will do my best. And then they could check to, to, to save energy and water and reuse their towels. They could check yes or no. Most people, of course, checked yes, because, you know, I don't want to look like a person that doesn't care about the environment. So I'm going to check yes, but that's it. I check this yes, I walk away and unbeknownst to me, my my towel reuse ends up being monitored. So what happens is that we found guests were 25% more likely to hang at least one towel for reuse um, if they received this commitment request at their check-in desk. Um, and so, you know, that, that was taking advantage of the power of behavioral science, uh, making one small change um, that seemed to actually have a pretty substantial effect on people's behavior um, going forward. Uh, so I will end there, but those are just a few examples of opportunities we've had. Um, you know, these projects, of course, were with charities and a hotel, but you can imagine lots of different contexts in which these ideas could be applied. Um, and so happy to take questions at some point if you do have any. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Liz. And yes, we will have time at the end for questions. Um, and you can also ask questions by using the chat feature or the question box feature, and I'll monitor those and get them to the right person. Um, but we'll definitely leave time for Q&A at the end as well. So with that, I will go ahead and kick it over to Ashley. Ashley, I'm sending you a panelist request right now. Great, and you can see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so I'll just briefly introduce myself. Um, my name is Ashley. Uh, I've been assistant professor in the negotiations organizations and markets unit here at HBS. Most of my research focuses on time, money, and happiness and how we can encourage people to make decisions with regard to time use and financial decisions that are maximally beneficial for their health and well-being. Some of the field examples that I'm going to be presenting today actually come from um, a Sorry, I see now that you'll also see that. <laughs> uh, come from a, um, uh, a role that I had uh, as a founding member of a behavioral science division in the BC provincial government in Canada um, over the last year. And uh, as Mike alluded to, uh, the idea of, of using behavioral science and behavioral economics to solve uh, important policy challenges is something that's uh, of growing uh, popularity uh, all over the world and so I was excited to be a small blip on this map uh, published by OECD uh, for Najito last year but there are many organizations and groups um, leveraging the insights from behavioral science and economics to solve important policy challenges. So as part of my role in the BC provincial government we were tasked with uh, policy challenges across uh, six different areas, uh, as diverse as tax compliance, uh, improving testing procedures in hospitals to increasing charitable giving among employees. Um, and I'm gonna just talk really high level and briefly today um, about three completed projects that we completed during our first year that um, our behavioral science division was in existence last year. Um, and so one major problem through interviews that we were doing with uh, various ministries is that it can take a long time in government to hire employees. Uh, so a complete hiring cycle in the BC provincial government takes on average 100 to 120 days. And when I talk to collaborators in the federal government, um, a, a similar pattern emerges such that it takes a long time to hire staff. And of course, this is uh, problematic given that um, you know, government can often lose out on key talent to other organizations with faster hiring processes. Now, while some of this has to do with the rules and regulations around the hiring process, other components of, of the challenges of the hiring process um, through interviews, we determined that at the beginning and at the end of the hiring process, managers or employees who work for the government who are in charge of facilitating the hiring process are often faced with massive amounts of paperwork, trying to decipher all of the rules and regulations around job posting, and all of the rules and regulations around sending out offer letters. And so although some of uh, the time is driven by uh, the fact that there's just a lot of steps in the process, 
some of the reason why it takes a long time to hire government employees um, is because there's a lot of uh, lengthy documents that government employees are often faced with, especially at the beginning of a hiring posting. And this can be particularly overwhelming, especially for employees who are new. Um, and so using what we had learned both from the interviews that we conducted with hiring managers um, and also uh, taking what we know from behavioral science and behavioral economics, which suggests that timely reminders can be one helpful prompt to encouraging action, in this case, making the next step of the hiring process available to interested um, employees. We uh, designed in a randomized control study with four conditions, and so I'm just going to present the results here. But basically, the main difference, the control condition took on average 80 days between the initial time uh, to when employees were hired. But when we reminded hiring managers who were new to the hiring process, and we followed up with them with emails and phone prompts throughout the hiring process, we were able to encourage um, uh, the hiring processes all the way through to completion uh, approximately 18 days faster. Uh, and this was by providing three email uh, reminders with specific steps in the process that the hiring managers needed to complete and specific phone prompts. So breaking up this huge block of information that novice hiring managers receive at the beginning of end of the process into simple digestible information um, and then following up with timely reminders was very effective here at reducing the time it took new hiring managers to put employees through the hiring process. And here we saw an average of three weeks faster just with simple reminders and follow-ups. Another policy area that we worked on um, uh, last year was looking at how to increase tax compliance and especially around organizations. Um, so although we all know we should pay our taxes um, at the end of the month, the way that the government had been structuring these reminders, they'd already been sending out email reminders to organizations to pay their sales tax. However, they sent them right after an individual had made, um, had paid their taxes. So mentally, um, uh, individuals who are in charge of paying taxes for organizations thought, hey, I just paid that, like that's way off in the future, um, really far from the deadline. And so because of this gap between when the taxes were um, uh, paid and when they were due, they were seeing relatively um, low compliance rates with, well, well, we'll see. I, well, there was some gap in, in terms of the length of time. They, there was some room for improvement, let's say it like that. Um, and so uh, to uh, capitalize on the fact that timely reminders can be a helpful way of encouraging people's behavior, we then uh, changed the strategy from encouraging um, reminders at 30 days to encouraging reminders at five days and one day before taxes were due, thus taking the cognitive burden off of individuals in charge of filing taxes um, at, by providing these timely reminders. And we found that uh, the provision of these timely reminders reduced delinquency in sales tax payments by 50% and saved 2,500 hours in compliance related time um, over six months. So this is government employees no longer having to, to chase after these delinquent filers. So this was quite successful and speaks to the power again of, of timing in terms of when these interventions should be implemented. In uh, the last project that I'll have time to share with you today that I conducted uh, as part of the BC provincial government, we are looking at how to increase corporate giving. Um, so there, there's a lot of uh, research suggesting that um, as Mike mentioned, people do wanna give more or act more in line with their charitable intentions. And we also know that charitable giving can have benefits both for health, happiness, and even productivity at work. So we wanted to examine um, a behavioral, behaviorally informed strategy for increasing charitable donations, and here for increasing the amount on average that individuals gave as a function of their paycheck. So here we were able to randomly assign employees to either um, a standard business as usual default option where they were at, during the annual fundraising campaign provided with the opportunity to give either six, 12, 20, or $50 with no default indicated, or um, in the experimental or default option, um, six, 12, 20, and $50, but with the $20 highlighted. And here, this is um, the default option. So it sends a social norm uh, to employees that maybe this is our recommendation. Um, and we wanted to see if this strategy would be effective. So what we did find um, here with about 8,000 individuals who completed this campaign is that the default significantly increased the percentage of employees who gave that recommended amount, and perhaps it was reducing the uncertainty of the choice, and again, it was sending a, a, a social signal or social norm 
uh, around maybe what other employees are donating. Um, with, we estimate that this probably raised uh, about $100,000 uh, of additional um, donations over the course of the campaign, but it's also really important to note that we did actually observe boomerang effects in these data where our intervention had the opposite of intended effect for a certain subset of individuals in our sample, whereby they donated more in the previous year when there was no default, and the default was sort of anchoring or setting uh, certain individuals who had donated more in the previous year to actually donate less, probably counteracting some of the overall net um, donations that we could have achieved. And so it's really important, and this highlights an important point, um, to think about and consider who specifically you're targeting in the context of these different messages, given that there's of, often heterogeneity in terms of how well these treatments work for different individuals. Um, I'm going to just present um, one example where we actually were able to exploit this heterogeneity or the fact that people think differently or have different mindsets going into a donation opportunity to increase charitable giving. And then I won't provide any more examples um, for the sake of time, but I'm happy to chat um, and answer any questions uh, at any point, uh, either today or offline. So here we wanted, in the context of increasing alumni giving, we wanted to actually exploit the fact that we know that there's different psychology depending on whether people have more or less money. So individuals who tend to have more money, on average, um, think about and interact with the world in a more independent way. So their mindsets are more focused on independence or autonomy. Whereas individuals of, uh, who ha uh, have less money tend to think about themselves in relation to other people or they adopt a more interdependent uh, way of thinking. However, most charitable appeals are really focused in terms of this more communal, more relational framing. So sometimes uh, one community needs to come forward and support a common goal, and this is one of those times. Uh, we wanted to know whether framing the charitable appeal to be more consistent with the more agentic or achievement-focused goals and orientations that typically coincide uh, with financial success might be one way of increasing charitable giving, particularly among those with the greatest capacity to give. Um, and so we did find evidence um, in an, a, a campaign that we ran at a large uh, university in the US, uh, not Harvard, but a, another uh, large university, that these more agentic or achievement focused messages um, did increase donations by 150, about $150 among those who made a donation and that these messages were especially effective for donors who made more money on average each year. And we saw a similar effect when we looked across the entire sample. Um, and so when we included everyone in, uh, who donated and everyone who didn't make a donation. And so altogether, um, you know, the, the, these field study examples, both from government and from um, some of the research projects that I've been doing, suggest that there are simple ways that we can leverage psychology and, psych uh, and insights uh, to um, help people make decisions that are aligned with their goals and intentions, but that we also have to be mindful and think about whether or not our treatment effects are going to work uh, in the same way for everyone. So I'm gonna leave it there. There's a couple of other examples in my deck that um, I'll leave uh, for the sake of time, but I'm happy to answer any questions about these or other studies um, at any time. So thank you so much. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, as I queue up Christine here, I just wanted to note for folks that are on the line or anyone who might've just joined us in the last few minutes that we're hearing right now from some of our partners at Harvard uh, Harvard researchers who are, are giving examples of uh, projects that they've worked on that might be relevant to you as you think about projects that you might want to do. And soon here we'll pivot to kind of what makes a good project and, and more information about how to apply. But now I'm going to turn it over to Christine Exley. Christine, you should be good to go. Great, thank you. Perfect. All right, so I'm excited to talk to you all about a few projects as well. I'm also at the Harvard Business School and I'm assistant professor in the same unit as Ashley here, the Negotiation Organizations Markets Unit. I'm a behavioral economist and most of my work looks at how individuals develop excuses uh, to justify why they're not partaking in, in some costly action. Uh, so to be a little bit more concrete about that, we often know that people develop excuses to avoid a, an array of costly activities. Uh, this might involve adopting healthier lifestyles, engaging in exercise, eating healthier, 
uh, investing in the long run, saving for retirement, uh, choosing to complete work now instead of later, and also, as we've seen a lot in what Liz and Ashley have talked about as well, helping others, so contributing to a public good or volunteering, donating to charity. The first study I want to uh, talk about with you all is on a different platform uh, than the ones that have been discussed so far. So this is an online experiment using Amazon Mechanical Turk as opposed to a field experiment, but it gives an, a nice uh, demonstration of at least the mechanism that I often study behind excuses. So one common problem, and Liz touched on this one as well, is how individuals often exploit overhead cost as an excuse not to give. And one potential solution that we were interested in looking at in this project is how about if you provide aggregate information instead of pieces of information that individuals can distort. As, so what I mean by that is, is the following. Uh, so we ask individuals, how much are you willing to donate to charity? Uh, but they were asked this in one of two conditions. In one condition, they were asked this in an excuse condition. So we told them there's this great deal, any any money you give to charity, we're going to multiply by five. So if you give the dollar, the charity is actually going to receive five dollars. But there is, uh, it is subjected to this overhead cost. And this overhead cost is either going to be 10 percent, 20 percent, 30 percent, or 40 percent. In the no excuse condition, we again say uh, there's this really great opportunity for you to give. If you give, we're going to multiply by some factor. But instead of it now just being multiplied by five and then discounted by the overhead cost, we tell them that it's gonna be multiplied by 4.5, 4, 3.5, or three. And one of the interesting things to note here is multiplying a, by a donation by five and discounting by 10% is actually the same as multiplying it by 4.5. Uh, so the donation opportunities individuals faced across this excuse condition and this no excuse condition were identical. If someone cares solely about the impact of their donation, how much the charity is ultimately going to receive, we should expect to see exactly the same levels of donations across these two, two conditions. And now perhaps as you're expecting at this point, um, this is not at all what we see. So when you're looking in the no excuse condition, when I just tell you the aggregate information, how much money overall is gonna go to charity for each dollar you donate, you can see that individuals are pretty unresponsive uh, to these various levels of quote unquote overhead cost. I'm equally likely to donate when it's gonna be multiplied by 4.5 as when it's gonna be multiplied by three, uh, the lowest the lowest match rate in the no excuse condition. Now, when you look at the excuse condition, when this is framed slightly different, I'm gonna multiply your donation by five and then I'm gonna take something off, you're now seeing this dramatic decline in individuals uh, willingness to donate on average. Uh, so what this study suggests is that individuals are keen to distort pieces of information as an excuse to keep money for themselves. And one way to counter their ability to do that is to not provide them with pieces of information uh, that are easy to distort, such as overhead cost. Uh, so, what, so what I take away from this study is that we absolutely want to think about ways uh, that we can present information, perhaps in a more aggregate fashion, uh, that counters some ability to uh, develop these excuses to get out of giving. Now, moving to the, the second study, the second study here was a field experiment, and it was done via an online voting contest. And the question or the problem that we had in mind here is that when you give individuals time to ponder uh, whether they're willing to donate to charity, uh, they often do one of two things. So one is they'll avoid the donation ask altogether. I see a solicitor coming to knock on my door, perhaps I don't answer, or I walk in a different direction when I see a, a solicitor on the street. Or uh, perhaps even if I'm faced with a donation ask, I find reasons or I develop these excuses to decline to ask. So one potential solution is to provide individuals or surprise individuals with a donation ask. Uh, you might also want to quickly uh, provide them with information on why to give, maybe to counter some of these uh, tendencies to develop excuses not to give. Uh, so the online voting contest uh, took the form of a standard contest that, you, that you're probably familiar with. Uh, the idea is you vote for your favorite charity. In this case, this involved animal rescue groups. You vote for your favorite charity, whichever charity charity gets the most votes during the contest period will win some large prize. Uh, now, when you went through the process of voting for your charity, uh, this is where the experimental manipulation was able to come in. 
Uh, so in particular, we had a few different versions of this study. Um, the first uh, variation that we did is whether or not individuals expect to be asked to give after completing their vote for the charity. Uh, so in one case, we just did not forecast that after you've casted your vote, let's say for the San Francisco SPCA, I'm going to ask you to donate to the San Francisco SPCA. Uh, so if I don't forecast that, when you see this ask after donating, that might come as a surprise. In another condition, this ask was expected. Uh, I tell you from the beginning, please vote for the San Francisco SBCA, and we also hope that you will donate to the San Francisco SBCA at the end. We also varied whether we provided with individuals with reasons on, on why they should give, why they should support this particular cause. And um, we varied the method in which we provided that information. Uh, but let me jump to the results to give you a sense of what happened uh, here. Uh, first, this is a review of the design, so the unexpected ask. If you just pay attention to the line towards the bottom of this screen, uh, this would say, do you love the San Francisco SBCA? If so, register your vote to the next step. And when it was expected, we just added eight simple words that if and you want to, donate to them. Uh, so this would be the condition where you know an ask is coming. And so what do we see? Well, when we look at individuals' willingness to click through uh, to complete a donation for the animal groups, uh, individuals are about 10 percentage points less likely uh, to be willing to click through to donate if they expected the ask to come. So the way I think about this, if you know someone's coming to ask you for a favor, uh, you might be able to think of reasons about why you want to decline that favor. Well, if someone surprises you, with a request uh, to complete some favor, perhaps is going to be more difficult to decline it. You're going to feel compelled uh, to say yes. Um, when you provide unavoidable information, so when I flash on the screen, uh, here are some great reasons to support the charity. You're seeing that this effect is becoming mitigated. Uh, the impact of the expected ask and unexpected ask now looks quite the same. But one thing that turned out to be really important is that this information was provided in an unavoidable format. Uh, you just immediately see the story as opposed to having to click on a story on why to support this donate. And in particular, you can see this as follows. If it was possible to avoid this information or if it was easier to avoid this information on why you should support this charity, for instance, you have to click this link uh, to read this story, then we are again seeing this pretty detrimental impact of individuals uh, expecting the ask. So what we take away from study two is that surprising individuals with donation asks, we can think of surprising individuals with pro-social asks more generally, can be a really effective strategy to counter some of our excuse-driven tendencies. And we also uh, highlight a, a common and important uh, finding in the literature that the manner in which you provide this information matters quite a lot. If individuals can avoid information, that often could fully counteract the effectiveness of the information. So in the third and final um, study that I'll talk about with you all real quickly, this was actually a project uh, that was done in collaboration uh, with the uh, big and MIT, MIP um, collaboration last year. So this was done in coordination with the Burlington Electric Department. Uh, and this is using a similar manipulation related to whether or not you expect to be asked to give. Uh, we had a slightly different question here, and this was looking at if you expect to be asked to support a charity, and I ask you how much you support this charity, uh, are you going to hedge in terms of how much you actually uh, support this charity? So to be a little bit more specific on the design, so the Burlington Electric Department sent out a customer survey, and on this customer survey, they ask their customers to provide a series of a question, they ask them to answer a series of questions that provide feedback on a series of programs. One of this is the warmth program. Uh, so the warmth program is actually a nonprofit arm uh, that provides assistance to individuals uh, who can't afford their heating and utility bills during the winter months. Uh, and one of the questions then was, how supportive are you of the warmth program? But they were asked this question in two conditions. They were asked this question when they knew we were going to subsequently ask them to donate to the warmth program. And they were asked this uh, in a condition where they did not expect this donation asked to happen. And so what happened? Well, when individuals didn't expect to be asked to give, they're much more likely to indicate that they endorse or that they support this warmth program. 
So this final study uh, just reiterates how um, eliciting support before a donation ask is expected, before individuals can develop excuses actually not to support that particular cause, uh, can be effective at countering some of these excuses. So that's all I have to you today. And like Liz and Ashley, I'd be happy to uh, answer questions offline or, or later in the webinar today. Great, thank you, Christine. Um, and I will pause here. We're, we're going to kick it over to Oliver and Holly next to talk about what makes a good project and how to prepare. I'll pause here for just, just to see if anyone has questions uh, for the researchers about any of these projects. Um, and hopefully this has helped you start to think about uh, opportunities that you might have, um, ways to apply these different behavioral science techniques to challenges that you think of in your own communities. Um, I will switch screens over to Oliver. I'll pause here for questions. Again, you can chat out questions or use the question box or raise your hand and I'll unmute you. I'll pause for about 20 seconds to see if anybody, anybody takes me up on it. All right, seeing, uh, I see one question here for Christine for the second study. Uh, did the results show that providing no information at all is better under the unexpected scenario? So they did not, although it is directionally moving in in that direction. Uh, so there's a few hypotheses that we have. Um, one might be when I provide you on reasons about why you should support this charity, that might be a telltale sign that I'm going to subsequently ask you to donate, um, which again leads to how the way in which we ask can also influence how much time we're giving individuals to develop an excuse. Thank you. Any other questions for the researchers? on these examples. Great, well, feel free to continue to chat out your questions and then we'll, we'll also open it up for Q&A afterward. And again, um, this is being recorded and will be posted and sent to you after the webinar. So with that, I will turn it over to Holly and Oliver. All right, hi everyone. Um, Oliver and I will be talking about what makes a good behavioral insights group and Mayor's innovation project, behavioral science project. Um, so hopefully uh, we can help you tie everything you've heard here together and think about how to develop a really strong application and also ultimately have a successful um, research project at the end of it. Um, my name is Holly Dykstra. I'm a doctoral student here at Harvard. Um, I do work uh, with city governments, including here in Cambridge, and I'm also a research fellow with the UK's Behavioral Insights team. Um, Oliver, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. So my name is Oliver Hauser. Um, I did my PhD at Harvard um, a couple of years ago. I'm now a postdoctoral researcher at the Harvard Business School and at the Harvard Kennedy School. And I previously spent also some three or four years ago, I spent some time at the Behavioral Insights team in the UK government, the, the NUTS unit. Um, and yeah, so we're looking forward to giving you kind of a bit of an overview over a lot of the common themes that you will have seen in, in the projects that you've just seen presented. So Holly, go, go ahead. Um, great. So if you could go to the next slide. Can you see the next okay, slide? So, yeah. yeah. Um, so the first part of uh, making sure you have a good application and a strong um, research project is um, thinking about asking the right questions. So one way to start brainstorming for a question is to start with a big idea. Um, here we say, how do we better help people in need in our city? Um, and you might want to think about specific groups you, you help or specific programs you have that you think you can improve. Um, and eventually you want to be able to narrow it down to a specific question. So with Christine, we just saw, how do we increase annual donations to the ward program, which helps people who can't pay for the heating in Burlington, Vermont? Um, so we're going to talk about what makes this question a very good question in the context of having a BIG research project? Next slide, please. Okay, so the first component of um, developing a good research question is 
thinking about what your outcome variable is. Um, and your outcome variable is the thing that you want to change and the thing that we'll be measuring to see if our program or our intervention or our research idea worked. So um, the first important thing is to make it very specific. So in the warmth program example, we were specifically measuring whether annual donations went up or not. Um, the second part is to try to use existing outcome variables whenever possible. I'll be talking about this more on the next slide, but that means things where you might already have some data available. Um, it should also be numeric or quantitative, um, something where we can have a concrete answer to the question whether the outcome variable improved or not. And ideally, it would also be something that's collected automatically, for example, online, where the infrastructure is already in place to be able to collect the data on it. So some good examples of outcome variables include the number of emails received, uh, the amount of online donations, the number of claims submitted online, the number of payments made on time, et cetera. Um, not good would be things like qualitative data where uh, it's more subjective whether we were actually able to influence the outcome or not. So something like the quality of conversations. Um, also self-reported survey. So if you wanna ask people um, how good do you think this is? What's the quality of the conversation you had today? That might be good information to have, um, but because it's subjective, it doesn't help us understand whether the outcome actually increased or not. And also hard to collect data. So the example here is littering because you might wanna think about um, decreasing the number of uh, litterers in your parks, but you can imagine some way of measuring that, like asking someone who picks up the litter to, to uh, count the number of pieces of litter they have, but obviously that would be really difficult to do. And we also don't have existing infrastructure and data on that in the first place. Um, next slide, please. So um, as you can see, the data component is very important. So we wanna focus a lot on um, what data you have when you're considering what projects to use in your application and to work on with us. So. Um, Existing data is very, very helpful because it helps us understand the problem and find a solution in the first place um, and later helps us understand whether we actually had an impact on it or not. Um, and for example, the granularity of the data is important. Um, you heard with Liz Keenan earlier when she was looking at um, increases in charitable giving. She found an increase and she was able to know that it wasn't that people who donated gave more money than they did before, it's because she actually increased the number of people who donated. So um, having that data in place is really helpful because it lets us dig deeper into the question and see what we're actually changing at the end of it. So for that um, and for your application, um, it's very helpful if you know what existing you already have. So um, that includes your outcome variables like we talked about and also demographic information about who it impacts, things like gender, age, location, et cetera. Um, also, it helps if from the outset you know how to access that data, because it could be the case that you have the data, but um, you're not sure where it's housed or who um, has uh, access to it to begin with. Um, and also to think about how you want to share it with researchers. Um, and here it says de-identified data, which specifically means for privacy reasons, data that um, where the researcher won't be able to identify who the individuals are. So um, we will talk about that more later, but something like um, taking away the names. Um, and Harvard has secure transfer systems in place to make sure that we do that right. Next slide. Okay, so the next part that we wanted to talk about, and we're gonna run you through a, an example, um, is what an experiment is. So we've been talking about that a lot, and I'm sure you've picked it up through listening to the presentations today, but we just wanted to break it down more carefully for you. Um, so experimentation means something very specific when we're talking about it in the research context. So it's not just the same thing as making a change or trying something out or running a pilot. It's a specific scientific methodology. And what we're using is the gold standard in science, and it's the same thing that people use in medical research. Um, in trials to test new medicines, for example, and that's the randomized control trial. So you've heard people talk about it, and it's also known as um, an RCT. We'll refer to it as an experiment. You also hear it uh, 
being referred to as a field experiment, uh, which means that it's happening in the real world and is separate than um, something in an art artificial setting, like a laboratory setting. And also people talk about it as an A-B test, although usually an RCT implies something a little bit more rigorous than an A-B test might. And um, the basic of what you're doing with an RCT is comparing two groups of people who otherwise are identical and the only difference between them is the new change that you've introduced. And that's how we'll be able to know whether the new change was what caused the difference in the two groups after the intervention has taken place. But now I'll turn it over to Oliver who can tell you a little bit more about that. All right, thanks so much. So I'll quickly walk you through an example and you've heard a lot of examples already and I remember early on Mike also gave a an overview, a picture of what we mean when we say randomization and why it's important. I'll give you a quick example um, how we might use this. And this is from a um, trial that the Behavioral Insights team ran several years ago in the UK, working with their tax authorities, HMRC. And in particular, they had a particular population of people who hadn't filled out their taxes yet, and they kept sending them letters. And for some reason, they kept not filling out the forms. And so they had a standard letter, which we will refer to as the control or control condition. And uh, that letter was sent out to a group of people and it contained a link to the website. And when people you know, received the letter, they would go to, hopefully go to the website, look around, find the form that they needed to fill out and then um, return their taxes in time. However, um, the behavioral insights team had some, how an intuition that this would probably not be the most efficient way of doing it, that, there may be reasons why people develop an excuse not to pay their taxes on time. So one of the things they did is they tried a new letter out. And in this changed letter, the treatment condition, they kept everything the same except for the link that they included. So they didn't just include the link to the website, but specifically a link to the form directly. And what's important is that, as Mike said at the very beginning, you could just change those letters from one day to the next and everybody receives the, the new, the changed letter. However, if you did that, we didn't ever know if any change afterwards was directly related and caused by the new letter or any other thing that has been happening in, in the world or in the ecosystem or in, that pe uh, in, in the people's lives at the time. So instead, if we have two letters, the control condition and the treatment condition, we might want to take a population of individuals that we are interested in, that could be households, that could be citizens in your town, and we, they are, as far as we know, they have different characteristics across the population. But what we do is we simply randomly assign them to diff two different conditions. One of them is the standard letter, the control condition. And the other one is the treatment condition where they receive a changed letter. And because we randomly appoint, uh, selected and allocated them to the treatment and the control conditions, in expectation, those, in expectation they, these people will not be different from each other because we didn't go out and just select men or just women into one of the two groups. We randomly selected them. So in expectation, they're identical. So now we can really see whether the difference that we observe in the number of people who paid their taxes is due to a different letter. So imagine now we do our data collection a little bit later and we, we find out that in the um, control condition, let's say for instance, three people responded to the letter that they received and if we then also find out that the people who received the change letter in the treatment condition, if there were six people who um, responded and actually ended up paying their taxes, then we can actually conclude that the new letter is about twice as effective as the standard letter. Now, of course, this is a, a, a fictional example, so it's not the case that actually that many people more filled out their taxes on time, but you get the idea that if we make those changes and we randomly assign people to conditions, then we can actually talk about the causal effect that the treatment letter had over the control letter. So with that in mind, there's a couple of other characteristics that we are looking for in projects and where we really um, try to recommend to our um, partner organizations that they think about it very, very deeply. So one of them is sample size. You may have noticed that in several of the projects that the researchers presented earlier on, they mentioned you know, thousands and sometimes tens of thousands of people who took part in the experiments. And without getting too technical, the reason why that's important is that um, we try to have as big of a population that's relevant for the experiment as possible. Because if we took very small samples, then the noise would increase. We would have a very hard time knowing for sure whether 
um, if we send it to a small number of people, the, the treatment letter, for instance, might actually be effective. And I'm not going to go too much into the technical details. This would be something you would encounter when you talk to your um, researcher later on down the road if your project gets selected. But for what's important to think about right now is, can you find the largest population that would be relevant for an experiment? So in this case, I'm just giving you a few examples, and these are not numbers that are uh, set in stone. They're just giving you kind of an estimate of the, the extremes that we're thinking of. If you start sending letters, you might want to have tens of thousands, for instance, of people that receive a letter, because often letters, um, the, the return rate and the response rate may be relatively small. If you only had 500 people that you send a letter to, possibly it's enough, but um, you're probably pushing the boundaries. So we would recommend to go much larger than that. Similarly, websites often have a lot of traffic. So there we might want to think about tens of or even hundreds of thousands of visitors a month. 1,000 maybe on the smaller end, and might be difficult to run an experiment with. And lastly, if you have um, consultations or office visits um, in, in per month um, in your government, then if you only have 50, that's probably at the lower end and very hard to do something with. But if you have hundreds or 1,000, then that might be a lot easier. So again, these are not um, numbers that are set in stone, but something to think about that we are looking for very large samples. Another part that is often, when, when we meet with organizations, we have found the most successful um, projects that we have run have a direct and individual private channel to particular people that we're working with, let's say citizens or households. So that means we would send emails or a postal mail, a letter to people, or we have an in-person contact. It could also mean that we send people to a website and we randomly assign them to one condition or another. But in all of these um, individual and private channels, what we can do is we can randomly assign people to different conditions, which is what we said before, really important for running a field experiment. And very often we get asked why we can't use, for instance, Twitter or Facebook for our experiments. Um, because, you know, there's often an idea that if we do something, we want to get it as quickly as possible to as many people as possible. However, the downside with that is that we can't customize different conditions if we put out a, a Twitter message to all of the state or to an entire city. So these ideas are often good to keep in mind, like how do you want to take something that might have worked and then scale it. But for our research purposes, we're really looking for direct individual and private channels, something that goes directly to individuals and households. Finally, one of the things that we've often also found really helps is if you think from the start, from the onset of your project, who are the people that you need to help you make this project a reality? So at the very top, you probably need somebody who is really excited about this and who gives you sign off that you have the authority to actually make the decisions to make changes in in the policy process that we're interested in working on. You might also want to have a contact person that is directly in contact with the researchers, kind of pulls together the different people that we need in different departments, and that has regular interactions and calls with the researcher team. And finally, you'll need people on the ground. And that's important because even if you have the high sign of a uh, high level sign off and you have somebody who's enthusiastic at a mid level, at the end of the day, we will need um, help to actually make it a reality in your organizations and in the governments. So one of the things that we're thinking about now is try to have um, people at all of these levels available and think at what point you need them. Um, of course, in setting up this project, it's one of the things that you will discuss with your researcher team, you know, at which point you need whom. And finally, one of the things that we wanted to um, touch on is kind of the different phases that you'll go through. And so one of them that we have often started with is like an, an early exploration phase, because obviously if you have a good idea and if you start thinking about the questions we've discussed in this call today, then you will want to make sure everything's ready when researchers come in and help you. But there's a back and forth. We want to figure out, have we fully understood the problem? Do we have data that we can already let you know, speak basically and see what are the current patterns? And once we have that, we can then actually precisely and concisely say, what do we think is going to be the new intervention we want to test? And at that point, we're going to enter the intervention phase where we actually run the field experiment, the RCT. And at that point, you would um, work with your um, Harvard researchers. We would suggest probably what we think is the likely um, treatment and intervention that we think is likely to work based on the literature and um, behavioral science and behavioral economics. 
what are the psychological insights that we think are most likely to change something here. And we will propose a research design. So what are the control and the treatment conditions? We will also go into a bit of technical detail, things that we can um, provide help with, for instance, the sample size. You know, what do we think is the minimum that we need? Again, the bigger the better, but at that point we will also be able to tell you a bit more specific numbers. And finally, we will um, rely on you to help implement that RCT. And obviously, the Harvard researchers are always here to help you guide this process, because for many of you, it might be a new experience, and this is something where we can provide that expertise. And so finally, um, there will be a back and forth. When we have run the experiment, you would share the data with the Harvard researchers, and then they would share the results and the insight that were gained from that experiment with you back. So in summary, one of the things that we have started off um, saying at the beginning is start thinking about your, uh, your question from a big question to a very specific one. Start thinking about that now. Also look around for the data you might already have and think about the outcome variable. We will talk a lot about experimentation and we mean something very specific by that, which has to do with randomization, which is very important. So if you can already think about how would we randomly assign people, that's very helpful. But again, this is something where the Harvard researchers can help you, but we will be talking about this a lot. We're thinking of big sample sizes and we will need a team that's authorized to act and implement at all different levels. And finally, we should say that um, we've always uh, had a great time working with, with governments and organizations to really make an impact. So research is really exciting on both ends because you will engage in very novel exploration. We will find something exciting and new and hopefully we can test something together that really makes a big impact in the world. So with that, I'll turn it over back to um, um, Katya and we are here obviously if you have any questions either now or later just reached out to us please. Great thank you Holly and Oliver that was a really great summary of of really what makes a good field project and also you'll see uh, when you look at the application shortly here you will see those elements reflected in the application so it's a little bit of a longer application this year and that's really to make sure we have all the information that we need to address those kind of key questions and make sure that we're able to work with you and that the project is a good one for this kind of experimentation. So what is next? You will receive an email in about an hour after this uh, webinar ends with the recording, with the slides, and with the link to go to the application, which will be live and like I said, will uh, we'll stay open for the next three weeks. Um, and also obviously contact information for all of us if you have additional questions. I'm going to open it up for questions for any of our, our researchers right now. I have one to kick us off uh, that was submitted online. Uh, speaks to the sample size question. It says, smaller jurisdictions will tend to have smaller population sizes. Is sample size a barrier to participation for smaller cities? Might be a good question for Oliver. Yeah, sure. So I'm happy to take that. And if any of the faculty have other thoughts, then please jump in. So I would say that um, we, we have encountered this in the past, that sometimes you'll have a great idea and then you know we, we go down the path and realize that for this particular idea, for the kind of intervention that we are um, planning on doing, the sample size might not work out. You might only have 20 or 50 or 100 people. And for some, and, and in this particular context, we think that this may not be enough. And uh, it depends on a number of different factors. So whether or not 100, the, the example I just gave, um, but 100 is too much or too little, it's hard to say up front. But I would say that um, you should think about kind of as broad as possible, what is the pool that you could access? And sometimes that may go a little bit outside your um, jurisdiction. Potentially you could work with people that are similarly interested in your area to expand their pool. So to some extent, it may require thinking creatively about what kind of pools of people do you have access to and who would you like to impact? But um, in, in light of, you know, the fact that this is an application process and something that is a two-way conversation where we are trying to figure out, is this something where an experiment could work? It's better to submit an application and be as honest um, as possible about the sample size, even if it's on the smaller end, then we can figure out, do we think this has um, the, the right size approximately to run an experiment? It's hard to say in abstract, to be honest. Mm. That's helpful. Um, there was another question about what size cities were in the previous cohort. Uh, we said never mind, but I, I think it's still relevant. Um, and just to give you a, an idea, I think that our previous cities went from Golden, Colorado, at the smallest population size, with about 21,000, 
all the way up to Tacoma, Washington, with a, a population of about 211,000. So it was a pretty good variation in there. Just taking a look at the question box. I have, do you have any examples of experiments related to the issues of resistance to affordable housing density or innovations in mobility? Anyone that want to take, wants to take a crack at that? And be aware that you might be a mute, <laughs> self-muted. So this is a, a question around um, basically the, the sort of public resistance or not in my back, backyard uh, feeling, I think, is what's being asked. And so I wonder if any of the folks from Harvard um, have thoughts about um, interventions that might um, that you might be able to use in messaging around um, particular projects or planning work that cities do. This is sorry. This is Mike Norton speaking. It's a great question. I can't think of um, specific research, and if others have, uh, please chime in. But I can't think of specific research that addresses that. I do think there is some research. So part of the there's a couple things that go on with. Um, not in my backyard. One is it's a change from what we've been doing, which people don't like. And the other one is like, why can't we do it somewhere else instead of here? To the, it's a change from what we've been doing and I don't like it. There are some interventions that can help people um, get unstuck from what they think is the right way to do things and try something different. I'm not sure we know actually about how to message so that you're willing to do it um, in your backyard instead of other people's. It's, I think it's such a common problem though, um, that I bet at least some of us would be interested to work on that. And I think it's actually a great example of there's some problems that are really common um, for policymakers that haven't been studied because there's a lack of collaboration um, between academics and policymakers. So we actually, even if we wanted to study that, like if we had the idea, we don't have the partner to test it with. Um, so um, I wish I had a better answer, but I, I also think it could be a good opportunity. Thanks, Mike. Anybody else want to add to that? Feel free to jump in if you do have an addition. Um, just looking through the chat box, I don't have any other chatted questions right now. Again, feel free to raise your hand and I will unmute you if you would like to ask your question or, or provide a comment directly. Pause here for additional questions. So we have a question about um, whether the projects are only for individual cities or if cities can collaborate on one application. Um, and I, I think we'd be open to a collaboration. Um, it's not something we've done in the past, but I, I can't think of a reason that that wouldn't work. Does anybody have a different answer? I think maybe this is Oliver. I'll just jump in to just say that I think it's um, a good opportunity to think about, you know, if there are common problems and you think you have something in common where you would like to solve that problem and you might also have similar infrastructure, then it could be an efficient way of, of running an experiment like this. I would say in that particular case, it would be all the more important to think about when you do the application, who are the kinds of decision makers you need from both cities or more than two cities if you have that to sit in the room and make those decisions efficiently. Because it could be, especially in the time frame that we have given, that uh, it you might be held back by having just one city at a time respond and make decisions, and that would probably not be ideal. So if you go down that path, I would recommend really thinking about the processes you're gonna put in place to make this a collaboration that works for everybody in the time frame that we have available. Thanks, Oliver. A follow-up question to the, the previous question about resistance to, to programming, um, kind of an innate issue. With large issues like this, how can we best get from the broader issue to a specific experiment or a specific question? Um, it's definitely something that we can help you with in your application process, but does anybody have thoughts on how to kind of 
I'm getting from the, the, the big issue to the specific question or specific experiment. This is uh, Mike Norton. I can just say a word about that. So w one way to think about it is like um, if you had a goal to lose weight, it wouldn't be super useful to just say, I'm going to lose weight. It also wouldn't be super useful to say, I'm going to completely change my diet, completely change my exercise routine, completely change my sleep habits today because you're setting yourself up to fail. And so if you think about having a big goal, like to, to change the way citizens engage with X, um, there's a there's probably a million ways you could do that. If you do them all at once, people will just get confused. So really thinking about what's the specific behavior that we can start with. So like, I'm, I'm not going to eat pizza anymore is all I'm going to start with. And then I can track that like really carefully. So thinking about the, the big issue as there's many different manifestations of any big issue, but what's a specifically tractable one that you can start trying to change and really measure very carefully is one way to think about it. Like getting people to conserve water is, is of course great, but what are, what's one specific behavior that people engage in, like taking showers that are too long? Let's start with that, and then later we can think about the other behaviors as well. Thanks, Mike. No, we're nearing the end of our time here. So I want to ask if there's any other questions folks have. And just as a reminder, we'll be sending all this out to you. And then also feel free, uh, our contact information will be on that. Feel free to reach out if you have questions, specific questions about your own application, questions about the application process in general. Happy to answer anything we can or to connect you to who can. Any final questions for the webinar? Um, this is Oliver one more time, and maybe I'll just say something because you mentioned it with questions. Uh, we do realize that some of the things in the application, especially around things like sample size and things like that, may seem a bit daunting and technical. So if you're unsure about what to write there, it's always better to reach out, um, probably to MIP first or one of the researchers to ask that question. It's completely fine. We're happy to help with that and better to get that conversation started sooner rather than later. That's helpful. Great, with that seeing our time here and no other questions in the question boxes, I just wanna thank everyone for their time today. Thank you for tuning into this webinar. Really happy to have you all on the line. Thank you so much to our, our partners at, at Harvard uh, for their expertise and sharing that information with us. Uh, we are really excited to hear about your projects. So you will receive that information shortly. It will also be on our website at www.mayorsinnovation.org um, to access it at any time, but you'll receive the link to all those materials shortly in your inbox. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for presenting today. I really appreciate everyone's time.